Welcome to you all and delighted that you could join me in conversation, a very informal conversation this morning in relation to how University of Stirling academics and professional services are helping engage with industry. We've got a, a series and an informal question and answers lined up. So uh, I think I'll start by asking you all to briefly introduce yourself and perhaps um, say a few words about your research and the department. So Lewis, because you're next on my screen, maybe I'll start with you. So welcome, Lewis. All right, hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Lewis McGregor. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty of Health Science and Sport and specifically I, I work in sports science side of the department. Um, so our, our research really focuses as a department on health and, and sport and physical activity um, at a population level, but also at, within quite specific uh, groups. Um, so looking at elite athletes right down to, to clinical and infirm populations. Um, on a personal level, my own research focuses on neuromuscular control, neuromuscular physiology. Um, and again, there's, there's two real distinct groups that I tend to work with, which are elite athletes in, in competition, preparation, performance, but also um, yeah, more at-risk groups, if you like, um, particularly older adults and, and aging populations. Um, and what I like to, to try and bring uh, that's quite novel in terms of the research is applying a lot of what we do with elite athletes to try and help benefit the health of the more at-risk populations such as older adults as I, as I mentioned. Great thank you for that and Sandy a brief introduction from you. Sure um, so my research is in optimization and machine learning um, with little bits of what we call explainability so it's basically all about helping people make decisions uh, using AI driven methods um, and that's been applied to things like making buildings more energy efficient or transportation networks um, work more effectively uh, right through to medical applications where we're trying to um, just um, choose which drugs are, are being given to a person um, in order to achieve the, the best effect. Great. And you're joined by your colleague, Jason. Hi, um, I'm, my name is Jason, and uh, I'm also in computer science and mathematics. Uh, my specialization is also in optimize, uh, optimization and machine learning, but it's more on the healthcare side. So uh, we work with um, companies in Sweden and in Iceland for vocational rehabilitation, where we use AI to predict what uh, the likely outcome is for someone's rehabilitation, and then schedule a customized schedule for each individual person to try and guarantee or get as close to uh, possible to guarantee and that they've got a positive outcome. Thank you. And Lisa, you're very welcome to join our conversation. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, my name is Lisa Farrell. I'm the business development officer for the university. So I work across the board um, and I'm the point of contact for Interface. So I work with colleagues just on the translation piece, translating um, their research into real world applications. And then the other way around, speak, going out, speaking with businesses, understanding challenges and feeding that back into the university. And finally, Angus, welcome to our conversation. Uh, yeah, my name is Angus Hunter. I'm Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Sport. Um, I have a very similarish research breadth as Lewis has described. Um, in terms of my engagement with industry, I, uh, I've been working with industry on various research projects, and uh, some of these are with through pharma, others are through the sports industry, um, nutrition um, companies as well. So I've, I've got reasonable insight into a number of the schemes and the how the innovation voucher system links to this. And I suppose in my sort of more senior leadership role, I'm very keen to promote uh, the interface voucher scheme to our early career researchers in the faculty to sort of show them the, the opportunities and the pathways of what it can do. And sometimes I think it, there's very much uh, an emphasis throughout the university sector that everything's on um, the, the, the main so UKRI type bids 
And it's, make, it's creating this awareness that particularly post COVID, I think there's gonna be far more emphasis on building the economy and, and engagement uh, with, with business. So yeah, I'm very keen to sort of, you know, promote this um, to enable more of it to, to happen. Thanks very much to you all. And I think you've, you've touched on many of the, the topics that we're going to delve in a little bit more detail with over the, the coming um, few minutes. So maybe a kind of question to you and touching on some of the points that Angus has raised. How, how can your research be applied to support? And there's a variety of end users, industry, society, communities. So any, any thoughts from that? Maybe, Lewis, you've kind of talked about elite athletes and the kind of jump then to actually kind of how that helps our health. So how can your research be applied? Yeah, so um, as, as you said, and as I touched on, it, so underlying everything that I try to do is about improving people's health and improving their, their physical fitness, be that yeah, for, for sporting performance or be it for everyday life and, and quality of life quality of living um so yeah in, certainly engaging with communities and societies and uh raising awareness is, is a big part of that um so trying to uh link with with end users i suppose early on in the process um and not you know to, to use the cliche not live in the ivory tower of the researchers and, and be doing the research that we think is is going to benefit the end users by actually engaging with well what do people need and understanding um understanding the needs of uh, communities and societies and um, from an industry point of view as well I, I, you know the, there's a lot of uh a lot of big business involved in, in sporting performance to, to take just one branch of my research at the moment you know huge industry in terms of uh, performance aids um, and, and sporting equipment and again tying in early on with these uh, with these kind of partners to again understand their needs and understand what they need to understand and what research needs to go into their um, into their products I suppose and, and into their uh, uh, their development um, is certainly a big part of, of how my research can be applied with, with different uh, industry partners as well as, as society and population level. Thanks, Lewis. And you've got quite a, a range of end users then from communities to industry. And Sandy and Jason, I know you work closely together. Do, do Are mainly your end users individual companies or can you see a spillover to, to um, other populations, other groups as well? Um, well, a, a lot of the time it tends to be that we work with one company, but um, things will spill over into a product. So it, it ends up being something that that does touch on uh, a lot of other people so you know one company i've worked with um on a large scale is an airline so they've got hundreds of thousands of passengers and that's uh, fantastic so in theory um I, I can see bits of my work kind of reaching out and somehow connecting with a lot of people um, but right at the other end of the scale a lot of the time we work with very small businesses where it's one or two people we make something a bit more effective or a bit more efficient within their business and that's really meaningful to them um, and that's probably right as far as it goes but it's still worthwhile and Jason that probably gives a good breadth of the types of companies that you're working with so do, your research must cover or have applicability in lots of different sectors absolutely um, so any business decision we ever make is always going to be dependent on a small amount of uncertainty. If we can create a model to remove some of that uncertainty of the future, we can help a, uh, a business understand what they're going to do going forward. Um, going beyond that, when we get those models to the point that they're useful and good, we can also tweak a little bit going in and allow us to do prescriptive analytics, which means that we can allow the companies to explore different ways of, of moving their company forward without actually having to go and invest in it and, and potentially lose money or um, alienate customers. Or when it comes to, say, the rehabilitation work we've been doing with rehabilitation uh, centers in uh, the Nordic countries, um, we could potentially harm people's lives if we uh, make, make mistakes with these things. Very, yes, very insightful indeed. So, Lisa, there's no doubting the passion across the um, academic researchers on the, on the call this morning with respect to wanting to see their, their knowledge made useful. 
And so are there standard approaches across the university that have been adopted to help you know, make it turn the passion into, into actual um, knowledge and impact? And from your perspective, how, how do you almost make those connections happen? <laughs> Yeah, certainly. I would say there's no hard and fast rules for the way we approach this. Personally, my approach is one of dialogue. So when interacting with external colleagues, as a few of my colleagues here have already um, um, touched on, it's a conversation. It's in two directions. So I can wax literal about the research across the university. But at the same time, I always want to learn about um, the challenges in industry and feed that back to my colleagues who are always interested to hear about it because obviously you know that passion they want to make their uh, research applicable in the real world so of course they want to know through me what the challenges are um, and that you know that will help to shape their work going forward then we so myself and colleagues such as uh, Angus, Lewis, Sandy and Jason actively communicate our experiences with other colleagues and that propagates the culture internally and we ensure that our early career researchers are, are part of that conversation. Absolutely so communication is part of the key ingredient and you know it's quite daunting for a business perhaps to even consider working with a university it might be seen that there's lots of high walls around it or they talk <laughs> a different language etc so um what do you think, Lisa, is the hardest thing for a business or a community group to con- when they start that journey to consider um, when they're collaborating with the university? Yeah, certainly. As you said, there's, there's numerous factors, but I think um, especially at this time, you know, post-COVID, we're hopefully transitioning into a net zero world. Uh, we are finding that businesses we speak to are increasingly time poor. So the challenge that they have is they know they have a challenge, they know they need a solution, but the R&D funding and finance landscape um, can be a bit bewildering. Add that to the things you've mentioned, Siobhan, you know, the perception that universities might be slow moving beasts. We do encounter some preconceptions. However, at Sterling, we are a relatively small university and that does make us that little bit more flexible. Um, So we also work closely with our funding partners and with um, support agencies. You know, obviously we have great links with Interface um, and that just smooths the running of collaborations. So I think that always helps uh, the businesses if they know that, you know, we we can be flexible to their needs. We can move quickly when we need to. And we are already in contact with the funding and the funding support agencies. Perfect. Angus, you mentioned um, Scottish Funding Council Innovation Vouchers as being a key, a key starting point. And how do you feel that, you know, um, researchers can get the most out of that first collaboration? Well, it gives them the opportunity to sort of really get a, a relatively small scale study going. Um, it, the hope would be that they could get a publication uh, arising from that. But importantly, it's about that, that research developing a relationship with the industry partner, which then will hopefully develop into something a bit bigger. Um, I mean, sometimes from my experience, companies are attracted to it because they literally just do, they're starting out, they just do not have much money. So for them to put their in-kind time in, we get say 5,000 pounds to get a small study, it's ideal for them. Others, it might be more of a case of, um, they don't know risk much at the moment in time. So what they're trying to do is sort of test the water a little bit with the university to see, right, well, how, how is this going to work? Let's just see it. And then if then that, you know, we, we prove to be productive, we, we produce, you know, produce the sort of results um, uh, they're, they're wanting to, not, I'm not saying the data they want, because it doesn't often necessarily go the way they want, but then that enables them to get onto the next step. So yeah, that's, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And I think turning to um, Sandy, in terms of the kind of this, perhaps an innovation vouchers or other um, small scale program is seen as a starting point. How do you move that to a more longer term relationship? It's, um, 
I mean, you, you do have to accept that the, the thing is a bit of a journey. Um, and I think as, as Angus was saying, sometimes these things don't work out exactly the way that, that, that you wanted them to. So, you know, the proof of concept didn't quite produce the results that you wanted or, um, or that fancy technique that the academic wanted to try actually turned out that was either massively overkill or it was just it, it wasn't going to work um so you, you need to be very clear about all the expectations at the beginning and um, that actually you're wanting to set um you, you you're wanting to try and build up a longer term relationship with the company um and you, you ideally want to start out with a, a little tangible thing that that you can do with them um that that almost certainly will produce some worthwhile results and working together on that you 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 kind of build up the relationship and um at, at the end of it um you better understand the company they'll better understand you um and having been honest right from the beginning um it's it's quite natural that then follows into something else i think uh, probably of all the innovation vouchers that i've had um which have been a few now um more than half of them have led to longer term collaboration with the company of some sort but that's really encouraging to hear. And I think some of the golden threads I'm hearing from you is managing expectations, but yes. also building that kind of trust almost at the, from the outset that everybody knows what they're, what they're getting involved in. But I do like the fact that not all of them will be <laughs> perhaps give the results that were anticipated. But, but looking at the kind of standout partnerships, Lewis, do you have any that perhaps kind of you can bring to mind that might be considered as a kind of standout partnership from what you've and supported um so yes yeah, so i'm still very much in the early stages of my research career so so yeah I'm, I'm really the partnership i'm involved in at the moment is is the first of this kind um you know using an innovation voucher um and yeah even the, the stage of the project is still very early doors um but it's it, it's been a great experience um and, you know, working with a, a very small company, you know, in their very early stages. So I suppose there's a there's a symmetry there in terms of, of my research career and their uh, business career. Um, but, yeah, I, I think just kind of building maybe what, what Angus touched on about building that relationship and that trust. That's that's been the key for me is um, is really building up a, a good not just a working relationship but actually a, a social relationship so there is that, that element of trust there and working with somebody that you want to work with not just um to get from a to b but actually to to enjoy the process and, and the whole experience and um, so yeah that, that that's really the only example i can share um, uh, and without going into too much detail on the, the company name or anything like that Perfect. And Jason, I think you've probably had a, a range of engagements, not just innovation vouchers, but a, a range of different ways of working with industry. So what for you might be a standout example? I think one that immediately springs to mind is the probably the first innovation voucher I worked on. Um, it was it was such a nice experience where we got to speak to a company that we live in, uh, as I think Lewis said at one stage, our ivory tower of, of academia, where everyone around us knows all of our tools. We just take it for granted. But we went to speak to a company who needed not to predict something, but just to understand all the possible routes that they could take to get to their end goal. But there are so many different factors that you can't visualize this. You can't draw it up on a screen. Um, so we use some visualization tools, some from the 1960s, some from the 19 or the 2020s, and uh, just being able to show a company this, it was like magic, and it reignited a an excitement from our perspective as well, because we start to take for granted all these different tools that we use. We start to take for granted what we do, and when it starts to become monotonous, showing it to someone new can be a, a really rewarding experience, not just for them but for us as well. So for me, that's probably the one that pops out. I loved the, the words you use there in terms of magic. So, it, <laughs> you know, it is fantastic when you can open up that uh, box of knowledge, I guess, that you have and processes, et cetera, and, and make magic happen. Uh, and Lisa, you're a secret ingredient in that, making that magic happen <laughs> as well, because I guess you you have to be there making sure that all the mechanisms are in place for agreements and and, and enabling a smooth, smooth um, engagement. So perhaps you could describe some of the, uh, I suppose, lessons that you've seen what works well in, in these circumstances. 
Yeah, certainly. In fact, you know, just talking about their secret ingredient, it's my work with um, interface as well, I think is, is crucial in this. So even the example that Jason has used there um, in that particular one, that was that stemmed from an interface inquiry came through from me. So there was a bit of back and forward between me and the interface advisor about where would be the best fit. I think it was this one was originally uh, destined for some finance colleagues having worked before and particularly in a, a company that used optimization I immediately thought of Sandy and Jason um, so it's it's that it's back and forth with the behind the scenes that makes this happen as well um, and just as Sandy mentioned uh, sorry yeah uh, Jason mentioned there that all the different possibilities the different possibilities with each of these inquiries that come through so it's important that we have strong relationships with interface and we can have that back and forward conversation to understand the industrial needs as well as the capabilities within the university and where that collaboration best fits. Great. And I think a number of you have touched on the importance of knowledge exchange and, and working with industry and getting your research and um, delivering impact, particularly for your career development. Um, and Lewis, maybe we we'll explore with you, what advice do you have for other early stage career researchers as they embark on perhaps a, a journey to, to engage with end users? Um. Yeah, so I, I think what, one of the things probably that I've learned through uh, the innovation voucher process is, is to really put that, that impact, if you like, that end user, um, end goal, right at the very start of the process. Sometimes that develops out of a nice research idea and then the impact follows. So actually, really, uh, you know, the, the more successful route is always going to be if the, the impact or the path to impact is first. And so that's something that, that that's definitely, I learned through this process and um, that that's important. And, and that would be some advice. I think the other, the, the, probably the key advice, you know, that the, um, you know, you referred to, uh, to Lisa as the, the sort of secret weapon. And um, so I think, you know, engaging with, you know, engaging with, in the case of Sterling, you know, it, it would be Lisa and, and research and innovation uh, team um, but for whatever institution um, that early career researchers are working at. There'll be a there'll be an equivalent. Um, there'll be a Lisa there. So engage with, uh, you know, engage and reach out and, and make yourself known and make yourself available. At, you know, the example Lisa gave there that when, a, when a, uh, an inquiry came in, straight away knew that, that Sandy and Jason were the, the ones to go to. So again, for, for early career researchers, making sure that your profile is, is in the public domain, I suppose, and, um, and, and try to, to make sure that you're in the right room for these, uh, for these opportunities to happen. Um, you know, I think we always hear a lot about the kind of the, the, the serendipity and the, the chance um, that, that collaborations form out of. Um, and yeah, you really need to be in the right place for those for those lucky chances to, to happen. So that that's really all I could say um, in terms of advice for, for other early career researchers. That's hugely helpful. And Jason, I suppose you've used um, or you've been involved in multiple different collaborations. So how have they helped advance your career? Honestly, I think it's pretty much instrumental in my first lectureship position. Um, they keep, kept me employed through uh, a lot of my postdoc, back and forth through multiple different things. But I got to sample so many different fields and so many different collaborations that it wouldn't be physically possible under any other circumstance. If I went to industry, I couldn't jump from company to company every two months and get all these different kinds of experience. So it's allowed me to not only gain experience across industry, but it's allowed me to specialize in data science itself, which allowed me then to apply for a lectureship in data science. And I now teach data science as, as my day-to-day -day teaching. And I use some of the innovation voucher-based examples in that teaching itself. Um, and because I've been interacting with industry so much, it's now my admin role at Sterling as well. So I'm now responsible for developing those kind of conversations with industry and different companies. And Ironically enough, one of the first things that we talk about is the likes of innovation vouchers to try and spin up those initial conversations. And as soon as you can walk in to speak to a company and say that I can get potentially get a piece of research uh, done for you, and all you have to do is 
invest a little bit of your time, then companies become very amenable. And sometimes it's all it takes is that to break down the initial barrier. And you don't need to follow, like it, it doesn't necessarily need to be followed through with. It doesn't need to happen. It just means that the company becomes more um, open to those collaborations from the very outset, knowing that it's it's actually low risk for the company itself. It's great kind of uh, to hear, I guess, those breaking down the barriers, but also that rich variety of, of end users that you've got, um, been able to, to work with. And Sandy, from your perspective, from, you know, is, is there more that can be done to help, you know, early stage career researchers or postdocs to engage with end users? They might think, oh, is this a good use of my time? I should be focused on publications. So what, what do you uh, what do you advise might you offer? Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the first thing is really not to be uh, afraid of giving it a go, um, because you know, from the academic side, it's relatively low risk as well, um, and it, it can be a bit intimidating because, as we've talked about quite a bit, it's it's thinking outside the box. It's definitely coming out of the the academic language and the the normal kind of ways that we do things uh, to try and reach out to business. But you know, it's it's a really rewarding and worthwhile thing to do. So don't be afraid to give it a go. Um, I think certainly, I, I don't know whether this is something that Interface could do or whether it's, it's better being done within uh, individual institutions, but talk, you know, hook up with other people who have had innovation vouchers before. So you don't have to go in alone. You know, this can be a collaborative thing. So ideally find another academic who's had a successful industrial connection before and work with them on, on response and on building the, the relationship. Um, and once you've done it once, um, it's, it's much simpler to do it this, the second time. Um, and you know, look, look out for um, other examples of, of partnerships, other success stories, try to understand kind of how, how they've worked out you know, and, uh, and, and try to follow their, their example. There isn't really one single way of doing an industrial connection. There's, there's as many ways as there are companies, I guess. Um, but it's it's worth trying to take some kind of inspiration from what's gone before, um, because you know we've all uh, anyone who's had these connections um, has has worked through all of the language barriers and things already. So um, yeah, I guess that's the the short version is hook up with someone who's done it before. <laughs> Absolutely. That's really sound advice. And Angus, from your more departmental perspective, um, you know, encouraging early stage career researchers to consider the next stages in their research. Do you, do you think, um, you know, where would you rank on the scale within your department and are there more, more that could be done? Yeah, definitely. I think so. Because um, I think for any early career researcher, getting on the the ladder of tenure research funding is really hard, really, really hard. Um, you know, you, you can't just straight out of a postdoc. It's, you know, it's, it's you know, to go and get 300,000 on the um, uh, EKRI is, is very difficult. Um, it's not impossible, but this enables them just to get those, those initial steps, get the data, get the publications, develop the relationships. The other important thing in relating back to the UKRI, there's so much more emphasis now on impact. And I, I review quite a lot for Medical Research Council. And to actually up, up front have demonstration that you've got engagement with industrial partners really adds so much value. You can write the best research grant, but if you haven't actually engaged or shown evidence of, of project partners, then the chances are I won't get funded. So even through the, you've got this sort of a, a, an industry route and all the funding associated to that, but it does actually also help through the other more traditional UKRI type routes as well, because the emphasis on impact is, is getting bigger, not smaller. That's really insightful, Angus, particularly as you appraise some of the applications. Um, and, and I suppose even engaging with small businesses could give a level of impact uh, absolutely. And, they, you know, it's, you talk about, um, I mean, Lewis mentioned communities. <clears throat> You've got communities sort of local, national, global, and you're always your always starting point is local. So if, if you've got this engagement through industry that's, that's engaged with the community, then that's your, your best model to start. And then it, it, it just sort of broadens out from there. 
So we're sadly coming to the nearly the end of our conversation and it's been great to cover so many different topics, but I think it would be really great to hear perhaps some final comments from you all. And, and you have a choice. You can offer a, a top tip um, to actually you know, building a successful partnership and what, what do you think is the top tips? Or you can just offer perhaps a, another example of um, what you think is working well and what can be built on. So um, in no particular order, Lisa, maybe what's your, from your perspective, what's the, the top tip um, that you might um, consider for building long-term successful partnerships? Yeah, I think for me, we've touched on uh, numerous elements here, but something maybe we haven't touched on is maybe interdisciplinarity and lateral thinking. So when an inquiry comes in, you know, question, and is this the right department for it? Could this be two departments joining up? Could we get an early career researcher from a different department joining this collaboration? So it's just using, you know, different techniques and different fields of study um, on the one challenge, I think has been something that's been quite interesting um, for me over the last few years. Absolutely. And, you know, you never know what will happen having brought two different departments into this conversation. Absolutely. Great connections happening. And Sandy, from your perspective, any any wor final words of thoughts, examples? Sure. Um, so it, it, I really want to emphasize how um, worthwhile uh, working with organizations outside of academia is. Um, it can feel like it's a bit of a distraction because, you know, it's applied stuff and it's, it clearly can't be as challenging uh, or, you know, I can't get publications from it. And those things aren't true. Working on real world applied problems in uh, in a setting that's external to the university um, typically will introduce you to really interesting kind of niggles or challenges that you, you just don't get from synthetic academic problems and scenarios. So, um, it is really worthwhile, even from a pure research point of view, to engage with, with people outside the university. Um, so give it a try. And Lewis? Um, yeah, I suppose just my final point would be that, uh, you know, the innovation voucher and the process, you know, really gave me a lot of confidence as a, as a researcher to, to feel like I could actually step out and, and lead on some projects, you know, and, um, you know, this, this kind of got me started, I suppose, in terms of being the first project that I've been really taking up a, a bit of a lead on that's actually been successfully funded. So that's a, you know, that's a, a boost, obviously, from a career perspective, but actually just the, yeah, the confidence of going through the process and, and engaging with, with different partners and, you know, sometimes you know, networking can be a, a sort of horrible thing to have to try and do and go and approach people you don't know and speak to them. And, you know, the, yeah, really just the process, whether whether the, the, the project turns out to be successful or not um, by, by whatever metric you want to judge it, it it's, been a, it's been a success for me in terms of career development and um, in terms of what I've learned and what I've taken from it um, from, a, from a confidence point of view moving forward. That's great to hear. And Jason? Um, I think I'd like to say, don't be afraid to show some excitement for your work. Any company that we have dealt with that has interacted with Interface and has came through this process are really motivated people. And as soon as you can kind of show that you understand their business, their world, and then let you, some of your excitement flare up and they get excited too. And it, it generates a really nice uh, synergy between academia and industry where both sides get really excited about what we do. We end up developing really nice connections. And in at least two cases at this very moment, um, we actually discovered that they had other data sets that are purely from an academic perspective. But they've seen how excited we are about what we want to do and what we want to, to build. Um, and they're allowing us to use their data sets to do very academic um very academic endeavors. And I'm actually going from COI in both those projects to PI in both the other two projects that are purely academic um, and they will result in, in some very good publications, to be honest. But it's because we interacted, because we networked, because we were excited about those networks to start with that the rest of the career has kind of set itself uh, up. It's, it's started to build itself. Great. And Angus, final thoughts from you? Yeah, I suppose it's just, for me, a, a lot of the message, certainly for early career researchers, is 
with this process engaging with industry, I kind of think it's a bit like catching a fish. You get initial nibble, but you've, you've got to sort of carefully wind it in, bring the net. You might lose it, but you, you can then get it and bring it in. Whereas, as I say, going in cold for a bit, you're talking about success rates of less than 25%. Um, and that's what, and I'd say I've, I've had both. And, you know, for the, the normal research beds, you can spend three or four months of every waking life on this bed. And yeah, you've got a fairly small chance of getting it. But what I, I like about engagement with the industry is to say, once you get that initial engagement, you start to reel them in like the fish, then it's, it can be a, a lot more rewarding than just having that straight disappointment of spending all this work and you, you get rejected for it. So I suppose that's the thing I'd like to put out that would hopefully encourage researchers to look at, you know, explore this route. I think that's a fantastic analogy, Angus. I think we might we might take that forward in terms of yes, um, reeling in fish and making a, making successful magic happen. I think as well as what, what we've also heard this morning. So thank you all so much. It's been a brilliant conversation. I think we could have sat and chatted for much longer, but sadly our time has come to an end. So um, thank you all so much for sharing your insights, your thoughts, your honesty, and also I'm delighted to hear how, you know, from small little acorns, many long-term partnerships are growing. So um, I wish you all the best um, in your future careers and also in your future endeavours and engaging with industry communities and other end users. And particularly, I think, in how they are um, providing the platform to be able to draw in much um, greater research funding as well to enable your departments and careers to flourish. So thank you all. <laughs>